Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your presence in this seminar uh, to this PhD defense. And as Todd already mentioned, I'm going to discuss uh, our new finds on weed resistance to oxidic herbicides in two different species, one from Australia and another one from the United States. But before, before I start to talking about my research, I'd like to do a small introduction about the importance of controlling weeds in, in agronomic environments. So weeds, according to this research that was performed in 2006, are the, uh, among the pests, are the ones that can cause the highest potential loss. So if you don't control weeds at your, at your crops, we can have up to 35 or 40% of losses. But actually, if you, uh, if you control them and use the best management practices, you can reduce uh, your loss up to 74%. So, and the main, the main tools that are used for controlling weeds are herbicides. And nowadays, the food production uh, are facing really uh, difficult challenges with herbicide resistance. As you can see, about 60% of the mechanisms of actions uh, involved in herb, all the herbicides that are applied in the field Having huge or having now huge herbicide resistance issues, but there are uh, two classes of herbicides that are the auxins and the long, the very long fat acids inhibitors that is still with lower cases of resistance. And as already mentioned, we are going to discuss uh, two different cases of auxin resistance that um, I studied during these five years. Uh, and introducing a little bit about this group of synthetic auxins, call it group four or group O. Synthetic auxins, they, the main char chemical characteristics are those phenoxy groups and the carboxyl groups that binds to the uh, receptors of the natural auxin, the endogenous auxin called IAA. Or in, uh, and the main, the main Auxinic herbicide that is sprayed in the field is called 2,4-D, which is this molecule here. And uh, nowadays, every year, about 161 million of hectare is sprayed with this herbicide. And there is something very peculiar and interesting about those herbicides. They are selective herbicides. So when you spray them at your field, it usually kills the broadleaf weeds but uh, grasses such as pasture or cereals, um, they survive to its application. So here, just to illustrate, there is a plot of wheat that was sprayed with 2,4-D, and the region, the area that was sprayed with 2,4-D, the plants, the wheat survived and it was able to grow, while the area that was not uh, applied with the herbicide, the weeds just infested and dominated the area, not uh, enabling the, the wheat to grow. And now, uh, and nowadays, the, the application of those kind of herbicides are going to increase because now uh, industry is providing new transgenic events where they put some bacterial oxygenase enzymes into soybean, uh, where when you spray the herbicides in those transgenic events, the plants are able to survive. So here, it's just to illustrate, there, there is a transgenic soybean right next to a non-transgenic one. And you can see that after application of the herbicide, those soybeans just got fried. And the ones with the, the transgenic event uh, survived. But how actually those herbicides work in plant cells? So auxinic herbicides, have their receptors in the nucleus. So when you spray it to plants, it's going to go inside of the cell and find its receptor in the nucleus. Uh, there are two core receptors, one called uh, one that is a protein complex called, called SCF to AFB and OxIA. And when 2,4-D binds to its receptor, it's going to activate transcription factors. And many, many uh, messengers messenger RNAs will be produced. 
At early auxin responses, there are uh, two main mRNAs that are going to uh, lead the first responses that we uh, that occurs after the application of herbicide. So those two uh, messenger RNAs are going to produce code for proteins in the peroxisomes, and the product of the reaction of those two proteins will generate a huge amount of reactive oxygen species. And the, in the presence of these reactive oxygen species, actin uh, will suffer carbonylation and S-nitrosylation, which will change the structure of the cytoskeleton of the cell. And then we can see the first symptoms of uh, after you spray in the plant. A lot of curling in the stems and in the leaves. And on later responses of auxin, another, trans another genes will be transcripted. And two important gene genes are the NCED and ACS that will uh, lead the overproduction of other two hormones, which are ethylene and abscisic acid. Those two hormones will also lead to some plant responses that will culminate on stomata closure and also tissue wither. And the plants will start to suffer uh, an intense drought. And with the increased reactive oxygen species, we're going to start to see a lot of necrosis in the leaves and the plants will eventually die. So as I mentioned, herbicides work by targeting enzymes and, and they're going to inhibit or induce the over, um, signaling of the pathway that those enzymes govern. And it, as I already mentioned, it's basically, uh, uh, we have a DNA that has a code for a protein. Those, this DNA is translated to a messenger RNA, and by transcription, this messenger RNA will turn into an enzyme. And nature finds its way to um, overcome or to adapt to those conditions when uh, we have a, a pressure su such as herbicide over and over on their plants. So um, with the mechanisms of uh, mut DNA mutation, there are some changes on DNA that can culminate on changes on the protein shape that will uh, lead to herbicide resistance. And this is called a target site resistance. Target site resistance means that the target of the herbicide will change its shape and will not let the herbicide bind to it anymore. So we can have a single nucleotide mutation, we can have deletions, uh, inversions, that will basically change this code and change the shape of protein. And then the herbicide will not bind to the plant and the plant will be able to survive. Another kind of targeted resistance, uh, target site resistance is copy number variation. When we have, um, uh, duplications of this DNA code, which will generate lots of micro uh, uh, messenger RNAs and producing several numbers of uh, these enzymes. So some of the enzyme will bind to the herbicide, but some will be free and uh, will be continue to do its uh, its work that it's supposed to do, and the plant will survive. Another kind of herbs, uh, kind of herbicide resistance. Uh, which is classified in another category, is the non-target site resistance, in which you have another genes that will code for detoxification enzymes, and those are present, are present in the secondary metabolism to fight against uh, agents, natural agents that could harm the plant. And those detoxification enzymes have active groups that, and they are able to bind the herbicide and attach those active groups in the herbicide. So the herbicide will not be able to target its enzyme anymore. Another kind of non-target site resistance is when the herbicide, um, when, it's when the plants develop some changes in the transporters, which will lead the herbicide to, to be excluded of the cytosol. So the herbicide will remain on the apoplast OB, or it will be stored at the vacuum. So the plants will not suffer its action. And actually in the field, how does uh, herbicide resistance develop? So 
weed populations have a high genetic diversity. And uh, sometimes we have those resistant individuals in, uh, in just a few uh, occurrence in the, in the field. And here I symbolize them by the resistant individuals having the resistant alleles uh, on this dark green and the susceptible ones in this light green. So in the first application of herbicide, those susceptible individuals will be killed and those ones will survive producing seeds and and those seeds will be stored at the seed bank for the next growing season. In the next growing season, we are going to have more resistant individuals. And uh, after several applications, those uh, resistant individuals, uh, by surviving the herbicide, will be able to produce even more seed. And then the resistant will be fixed in the, in the region or the area that is that the herbicide was used several times. And then the, the herbicide too will not be able to be used anymore in this region. So with that, I will start my first, uh, my first, the first chapter of this uh, defense, which is uh, a case of non-targeted re non -targeted resistance, which in which we found a metabolic resistance in this species called a water hemp, Amaranthus tuberculatum. Before I start, I'd like to talk a little bit about the mechanisms of metabolism in this herbicide called 2,4-D. So in high plants, 2,4-D can suffer reactions of detoxification and conjugation. In reactions of conjugation, uh, enzymes such as GH3 and UDP glucose are able to attack the carboxylic region of the herbicide and attach amino acids or sugars. And those, um, those reactions or those metabolism pathways are dominant in that dicotyledon species. On the other hand, we have um, enzymes such as monoxygenases and uh, dioxygenases, uh, SP450s, that are able to attack the phenoxy ring of 2,4-D and attach a hydroxyl group on it. And this is... Uh, uh, a reaction that is commonly done by monocot species. And an interesting aspect about those pathways is that conjugation reactions can be, um, can be reversible. So those uh, amino acid conjugates can suffer um, the action of those enzymes and turn back to 2,4-D. While uh, 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 those reactions of detoxification, it's really hard for enzymes to remove this hydroxyl group. So that's why it's called a detoxification rea reaction because once, once it is hydroxylated, there is no way to turn it back to the parent herbicide. So here I'm going just to talk a little bit about this species. Water hemp amaranth tuberculitis is a very problematic weed here in the US. It has 16 chromosomes. It is a dioecious, so uh, we have in, in different plants, we have differences of sex. We have male and female plants, and it's a prolific seed producer, about half million of seeds in a single plant. And it's also spread through all the US and Canada. Um, and what is fascinating about herbicide resistance is that we can see uh, the process of adaptation uh, going on in front of our eyes. eyes. And uh, here is the a uh, trial that was done when this population was fine. So this population was fine in the state of Nebraska, was highly resistant to 2,4-D. And here, as you can see, the untreated plants are big infestation of those weeds. And when uh, the field dose was applied, the weeds survived it very well and suppressed the grass that was supposed to grow in this area. And then when about four times of the dose was sprayed, the plants still surviving. When 31 times the dose was sprayed, we start to see some of the grass, but still some uh, plants, uh, uh, water hemp plants surviving under this dose. And finally, they treated with 124 times and they killed even the grass. So, um, and, but it was not just that, like 20 days after this application, uh, new water hemp plants just emerged and reinfestated 
uh, the area again. So it was a very serious case of uh, resistance. And uh, here is just to so show you a little bit on the evolution after uh, of the symptoms after the application of 2,4-D. So I got two plants, one susceptible and one resistant. I sprayed with 2,4-D and I took I took a picture every day until the susceptible plant dies. So as you can see, in the first three days, plants susceptible plants show regular epinastric effects. And then the tissue starts to show some drought. And in the seventh day, the plants are just dead. On resistant plants, the, on the first three days, we can see that uh, there are a lot of epinastic effects. But on the fourth day, the plants start to stretch their leaves. And then the stem starts to go up. And in the seventh day, the plants uh, just look like they you wouldn't spread anything to it. So uh, at the beginning, we did some uh, classic basic physiological uh, experiments of weed science in which we used 2,4-D that was labeled with a C14 uh, carbon. So uh, we were able to detect the radioactive sign of 2,4-D. So I applied this radioactive uh, 2,4-D in plants and uh, we took uh, several time points after application. And here I'm just showing the chromatogram for hours that I applicated, applicated the radio label and herb sign. And everything that will be in blue in this presentation represents the susceptible uh, plants and in red, the resistant. And on those chromatograms, we are able to separate each of the metabolites containing of 2,4-D and 2,4-D parent itself uh, because it was uh, C14 labeled. So you just could be able to see what uh, was tagged with this um, radio labeled uh, carbon. So as you can see, susceptible plants still have a, a huge peak of 2,4-D, even uh, 264 hours. At that point, the plants were uh, almost dying. And a huge peak of a metabolite that I call it metabolite 1. Resistant plants showed a totally different profile. We saw a smaller peak of 2,4-D. So 2,4-D was being transformed to other products. And the metabolic profile was very different. I found a little bit of this metabolite 1, but two other main metabolites, metabolite 3 and metabolite 2. And in this graph, I just show the percentage of uh, remaining 2,4-D over the time. So when I applied the plants 100%, I got 100% of 2,4-D, and as the hours were going, I started to see reduction because of this transformation into metabolites. And just as a reference for explanation, I used the, the time points that I got 50% of the herbicide metabolized. So resistant plants were able to metabolize 50% of the herbicide in, in less than 24 hours while susceptible plants were able to do that just in 105 hours, which is five times faster uh, rate of, metabol of metabolism in resistant plants. And uh, after all this quantification, we started to isolate those, isolate those peaks. So I collect this peak, this peak, and those uh, other two peaks. And by mass chemical mass spectrometry, of high resolution and nuclear magnetic resonance, we were able to, to find the chemical structure of those uh, herbs, of those metabolites, I'm sorry. So metabolite one was a 2,4-D aspartic acid that is a, a, a kind of an expected, uh, an, it was really expected a reaction done by uh, dicot species because dicot usually uh, conjugates the herbicides into uh, amino, uh, amino acid conjugates. But for our surprise, when we uh, deciphered the structure of um, the, the peak three right here, we found a totally different metabolic structure in which 2,4-D got a hydroxyl group at position five and uh, metabolite three had this sugar attached to, to the hydroxy group. So a P450 probably uh, attaches a hydroxy group and rapidly a UDP glucosyl transferase 
will attach this sugar in the molecule. And finally, metabolite 2 was classified uh, as a 5 hydroxy 2 for the glucose with a malonyl group. And this malonyl group will be important for the storage of this uh, metabolized herbicide in the cell vacuum. So the plant can just eliminate it and, and survive the action of the herbicide. And to further uh, confer if a P450 uh, would be leading to herbicide resistance in this population, we use this chemical called malathion, which is a P450 inhibitor. So we pre-treated plants with malathion, and then after 24 hours, we applied 2,4-D. And the results were very interesting. When we applied malathion, the plants recovered the susceptibility to 2,4-D. So as you can see here, plants behave exactly or really close to susceptible ones when they are sprayed. And in this graph, I just show uh, in these results in terms of dry mass. And to summarize it, to have an estimated effective dose that would reduce 50% of total dry mass, resistant plants would need to be sprayed with 192 grams per hectare, while plants that were pre-treated with malathion just needed four, 24 grams, which is the same amount that susceptible plants and susceptible plants treated with malathion would need to achieve this control. And after that, uh, to check uh, the toxicological effects of those, um, of those metabolites, what we did was to synthesize chemically those metabolites. Uh, so 2,4-D aspartic acid was made by this carbodiamide coupling reaction. And for 5 hydroxy 2 4 d I found this uh, reaction in a paper from 1975 that was for synthesized 2,4-D, but we made some adaptations and we were able to perform and got the, the resistant metabolite. And then I put those metabolites in petri dishes uh, and also the pyrene 2,4-D uh, in different amounts or different doses uh, in micromolar. And then uh, we measured root growth under different uh, doses of those metabolites, and also, and we did that in the model species called Arabidopsis. Those experiments were also performed in our water hemp plants, but to summarize the results, I am going to use uh, what we got in Arabidopsis. So as you can see here very clear, there is a reduction of um, the toxicological effect of, of each metabolite, uh, 2,4-D, inhibits root growth very in just like uh, doses in just in doses that are very low. 2,4-D aspartic acids had showed some root inhibition, but we needed a greater dose. And for 2,4-5 hydroxy 2,4-D, we needed a, a dose that was really, really high. So just to summarize those results, to get 75% of inhibition, we would need just 0.12 micromolar of 2,4-D. On 2,4-D aspartic acid, we would need a, a dose that is 100 times higher on 2,4-D. And 5-hydrox 2,4-D, we needed a, a dose that was 20,000 times, about 20,000 times higher than 2,4-D. Just to show that really uh, those metabolites uh, the metabolization of 2,4-D really makes it to lose its herbicide effect. And here is just to illustrate a little bit better uh, what, what was going on in terms of auxin responses. So we use this DR5 GUS uh, reporter system, which is a synthetic auxin response element called DR5. So it's commonly used to examine auxin induced blue staining, it means that it has some auxin action going on in this tissue. So at your control, you can see that there is not much uh, auxin action just in the, root, the tips of the roots, which is common. When you apply 2,4-D at the very first doses, very low doses at 0.01 and 0.1, we can see a lot of blue staining in red on those plants. When we applied 
uh, 2,4-D-aspartic acid, the signaling just started to show off at 0.5 or 1 uh, micromolar. But the interesting thing is that on 5-hydroxy-2,4-D, we just got some blue staining in the stem and at doses of 1,000 micromolar. Just to show you again that the hydroxylation of the herbicide will lead to its detoxification. Uh, and the staining of the 2,4-D aspartate is probably because this 2,4-D aspartate is turning, turning back to the parent herbicide, and the parent herbicide is acting as its normal effects in those plants. And with that, I conclude my first, um, my first chapter. And in, on, on this research, we concluded that uh, metabolism is five to six times faster in, in the resistant population. Susceptible so plants metabolize 2,4-D by, aspart uh, by an aspartic acid conjugation. Resistant plants perform hydroxylation, uh, which are detoxification reaction. And the, hydro uh, the hydroxylated herbicides are less toxic than amino acid conjugated metabolite, metabolites. And with that, I am going to uh, go to the next project, which is related to a target site. So changes in the proteins are the, the receptors that 2,4-D binds to. And that one is was in an uh, Australian species, the Indian hedge mustard, to Simro oriental. But before I start, I need to go down a little bit uh, more with details on the 2,4-D receptors. So as I mentioned, 2,4-D works as activation, as activating genes that are related to oxygen responses. Those genes are activated by transcription factors, call it oxygen response factors, and they are regulated by those, um, those repressors, call it oxIAs. And there, there is a uh, a very important aspect on the different uh, regions of this OxIAA protein that are divided in four different domains. Domain one, which binds, it's uh, a, a domain that is re responsible for um, the oxygen re repression. So it binds to this TPL that ha helps to close the chromatin and not let the, the genes to be transcribed when they are not necessary. The domain two, which is called the degrom, degrom comes from the word degradation. So that's the side that auxin is going to attach and lead to the degradation of this of this repressor. And uh, there is other two domains that are called domain three and domain four, and together they they form what is called the PG1 domain, and they heterodimerize with auxin transcription factors which really uh, inhibits its transcription action. And to regulate it, we have these uh, protein complexes called SCF to AF, AFBs, which are composed by four different proteins, the RBX, the choline, the ASP1, and the TIR1. Uh, and the TIR1 is this mushroom-shaped protein in which auxin is going to bind to. So we have auxin that is going to bind in the top of the mushroom like protein and also in the domain two of oxia. Oxia is going to be ubiquitinated, so these small um, peptides are going to be attached, and it will be a marker for this protein grounder called 26 proteasome. And the 26 proteasome is going to destroy, to degrade the oxia. And the auxin response factors will be free to transcribe those genes, leading to the early auxin responses that I explained in, this, in the introduction of this presentation. Now going back to our um, to my um, species, so Indian hedge mustard, Simbro oriental, it's a brassicum. It's a very problematic weed in uh, grain production areas in Australia. It has seven chromosomes. Um, and it's a, a monoecious self pollinator. So when those those flowers are open, they are already pollinated. 
Uh, it's a prolific seed producer too. A single plant can um, produce over 100,000 seeds. And uh, it's a problem in Australia, but here in US, we have some problems in California with this species too. So here is just my picture showing the evolution of the symptoms in resistant and susceptible plants every day after application. So in day one, uh, actually susceptible plants in the first day shows just regular epinasty and in the 15th day, the 50th day, the plants just died. Resistant plants doesn't show much epinasty, but uh, it recovers after 16 to 20 days. The, it, show, it shows new leaves flowers and the plants just survive. And to discover what was going on on, on these populations uh, in terms of uh, weed resistance, uh, Dr. Anita Cooper and Chris Preston, we, we, they, who started the, this project, created those recombinant in red lines. And those lines were generated by uh, the crossing between the resistant and homozygous resistant and homozygous susceptible plants, which are generating F1 uh, that were um, all resistant to, to the herbicide. So the, the resistant trait was dominant. And then they selfed those plants and generated an F2 generation, which uh, segregated three resistant plants to one susceptible, which uh, showed that it was likely uh, uh, just a single gene that was um, dominating or, or was, was leading to the uh, oxygen resistance. And then after that, they selfed those plants and obtained the homozygous resistant plants or homozygous susceptible plants. And those were called what we call uh, the red lines. And they made two different crosses. Cross A, uh, that they go one to the F4 generation, and from that, they generated three susceptible lines and three resistant lines. And cross B, which they went into the F3, and on that they were able to generate four uh, susceptible plants and just two resistant plants. And with those two crosses, uh, they made an RNA seq. And after processing the data, we found just three significant genes. So here is comparing. Uh, resistant, the, the resistant plants to susceptible. So the blue uh, arrows corresponds to genes that are down-regulated in resistant compared to susceptible, and the red one corresponds to genes that are up-regulated in resistant. So the, our first candidate was this PRP39, which we didn't find much information in the literature. Uh, the second one was this ox IAA gene, which is uh, which was really excited because exciting because uh, there was an oxygen receptor. It's it's an, an ox IAA receptor, and uh, but something some, some, at the beginning we we thought that 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 was quite weird because how could a uh, uh, oxygen repressor protein be downregulated in resistant plants? And this answer, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this this question on the next slide, because we found something very interesting about that oxide. And also, we found upregulated in resistance this ABCD transporter, which is a cellular oxygen efflux transporter. But the, for the PRP39 and ABCD transporter, we found at least at least one uh, recombinant in red line that was inconsistent with the general pattern. So we open all the lines that we open, that we sequence, and at least one resistant had the same characteristic of susceptible or vice versa. So we were able to filter just to this candidate. And we found something very interesting. Those are all the crosses, and this is uh, our gene uh, viewer. And you can see, in this area that there are some readings that are missing in, in the middle of the IAA2 gene for the resistant populations, but are present in the susceptible ones. So uh, at the end, what we found was a deletion, and it was in a very in a unexpected region. So uh, I don't know if you remember the, the different, 
uh, uh, domains or uh, that I showed on the IAA, the Tigron that was the domain two, and the Pizzle one domain that was domain three and four. Um, the Tigron is the area that auxin binds to, and the deletion was right inside of this Tigron tail, which is the bridge that connects the domain two and the PB1 domain. And at the beginning, we were surprised how could this a deletion next to the area that auxin binds uh, lead to such a strong uh, resistant phenotype, and uh, how how this resistant trait works is what I'm going to try to explain in the next slides. So first, to validate if the, uh, the if the resistant was governed by this deletion, we designed primers to do this. Uh, cast assay in which we design it, it's flanking the region, uh, the deleted region for the resistance, so it couldn't amplify in uh, in susceptible alleles, and we tagged it with a hex fluorophore. And to detect if the wild type IAA2 was in the genome, we designed it right inside of the deleted region, tagging it with a fan fluorophore. And uh, I planted about 200 and 212 plants, something like that. And I evaluated uh, plant injury in segregation lines. So I would have in these lines homozygous and heterozygous plants for resistance and susceptibility. So as you can see, plants that showed really high injury, about 70%, those plants were almost dying. They are all homozygous for the suset volume, so they amplified for the fan fluorophore. Heterozygous plants that had both the, the deleted and the, the, the wild type of use showed 24% of plant injury. And uh, plants that just have the resistant allude showed just 12% of injury. And the, the ratio was one to two to one, which matches with the Mendelian law and the resistance is probably constituted by just a, a single gene. It's dominant in a single gene. And to further uh, validate uh, the action of this deleted gene, what we did was to uh, make some Arabdopsis transgenic lines. So Arabdopsis is this um, mother species that we really like to work with. And I did several transformations uh, using, uh, first of all, um, uh, a new vector, so a, a vector that would have just a 35S promoter, which is a high expressing promoter. So this plant contains uh, just the promoter and no gene, just to see if there would be any interferences on the phenotype. And then I got uh, my uh, Cisimbro Oriental, my mustard IAH, and I put in this overexpressing. Uh, Promoter and I co uh, and we produced this transgenic plants having um, this this susceptible allele of AA2 and there was no changes on phenotype. But when we cloned it with the resistant version of the IAA2 on the 35 as promoter, heterozygous plants started to show some kind of phenotype. The, the plants were a little bit shorter and produced less leaves. But when we got homozygous or two copies um, of those, this 35S promoter with the deleted version, we got an auxin related phenotype where the plants were dwarfs and there were not many um, flowers and, no seed, and very low amounts of seed production for those plants. And to further confirm if the resistance would be related to the deleted version of the IAHU. We performed again those root assays in which we um, used several lines. In black here is Columbia zero. In, yeah, in terms of yellow is the new vectors transformance. In terms of blue is the susceptible version of IAHU. And in red is the deleted version of IAHU. Our control was DMSO. We used the natural uh, endogenous auxin IAA in 10 micromolar in those, in those plant plates uh, with agar and half MS media. 
And also we use the 2,4-D and dicamba. And as you can see here, in the presence of those auxins, we have a huge inhibition for all those plants, even for the ones transformed with the wild, the susceptible IAA2. But for the resistant versions, the, the roots just grew, grow pretty well. We, we just have a reduction comparing uh, to the ones that grew at EMSO, a reduction of about 20%. So as you can see here in the graph, compared to uh, the percentage of root elongation compared to the control, there was a reduction for both 2,4-D and dicamba of 10 to 20%. While the odd other plants, we got reductions of, uh, of up to 90 to 80%. Really showing that if you delete this degrom tail, the plants and put it into a plant, it becomes uh, resistant to auxin. And we also tried it in uh, post-emergency uh, applications. So this is my new vector, the susceptible version and the resistant version. Uh, as you can see at the very low doses, so those are different doses of 2,4-D going up to 2,000 grams per hectare. And this is 21 days after treatment. So at just 62.5, the plants just don't produce any flower and stop to grow. And if you get the, the resistant version of the allele, allele on the plants, the plants are able to endure open over 500 grams per hectare. And those plants for sure are going to uh, produce seeds and, and, and a huge number of flowers if you wait probably more uh, 15 days. And even at doses of 2,000, while those plants were um, really damaged, those leaves is still pretty green. So, and uh, to further confirm the interaction between um, the core auxin core receptors and auxin uh, itself in the presence of the deleted IAA2 or non-deleted, we performed some affinity binding assays using this very cool technique called uh, surface plasma resonance. We've done, and who performed actually those trials was Richard Napier and Dr. Mary Martin. And for this, we use those biotinylated chips that's uh, just a small peptide uh, containing the degrom, the degrom tail, and a fraction of PB1 were designed. And we made two versions, one for the wild uh, susceptible allele, allele and one for the deleted allele. In the, in the deleted one, we just didn't put the degrom tail. And these chips were put inside of the machine and a solution containing the tier one receptor and different doses of auxins were injected over time. And that's why we see those peaks. So this is a first injection and then a little bit of buffer uh, was, was um, put in the machines to see to see how much uh, was the binding between uh, IAA2 and its core receptors in the presence of auxin, but we also were able to see how it releases, how it dissociates. So this technique, we can see both sides, how it associates, but also how it dissociates to the system. And full lines here corresponds to the uh, susceptible version of the IAA2 allele. And, or protein, and the dotted lines corresponded to the resistant one. And you can see in all of the doses using the different kinds of auxins, in red IAA, in blue 2,4-D, and in green dicamba, all, in all of them, the susceptible version had always higher association and lower dissociation compared to the resistant. So the, the resistant tend to be less associated and be uh, less tend to be more, uh, sorry, tend to be less associated, and the 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 proteins tend to fall apart faster in the in the system while you uh, apply the the buffer. And with that, we are able to generate those KD values, and the KD is just uh, to to measure the relative. Uh, it's a measurement that you can um, that you can uh, 
it's it's a measurement that we you can measure how the complex is form, formed. So as we have higher KD, um, it means lower recognition. As we have uh, lower KD, it means higher recognition. So for all the resistant versions of the IAA, had lower recognition compared to the susceptible ones, which means that when it loses its digon tail, it's not it's not able to be recognized by the the core receptor in the presence of auxin. So those plants, um, so uh, those plants uh, are able to survive in the action of the herbicide because IAA two with the deletion is not yet subjectinated. And the lack, the lack of objectionation leads the repressor system to keep working even in the presence of herbicide. But, uh, and then we are trying to understand what is going on. Why does this digon tail is so important? And we've, in a re very recent publication from Nature Communications, uh, the scientists reported that there are two clusters that are non auxin that, that have non-auxin interaction capacities uh, in the presence of the ox IAA. So we have those two clusters, called cluster one and cluster two, in which the ox IAA um, protein is able to bind and embrace this mushroom-like protein and find its binding protein pocket in the presence of auxin. And with that, we uh, designed some um, uh, 3D models using available um, parts of the ox IAA protein. So in green, in yellow, we have the digrom in of, of IAA2. In green, we have the digrom tail, and the in red, the PB1 domain. And with manual docking, we are able to set exactly set this model exactly in the position that the uh, PB1 domain would bind and also the digrom. And we can see that the, the digrom tail is an important extension to make this PB1 domain to find its region that it can bind. And if you delete this digrom tail, you, you create a reduction of size in this, this distance of 28 angstrom. So the reduction of this uh, distance can impair the capacity of the PB1 domain to reach cluster one on, um, on the process of binding. So it really can't, it really reduces the capacity for it to find its uh, binding pockets in the presence of oxygen. So to summarize these complicated things, I'd like to just say that it's basically a question of hugs and kisses. So first, uh, IAA2, uh, the wild, wild type allele of IAA2 finds its receptor in the presence of auxin, and it gives a big hug in the mushroom-like protein. And after that, it finds a way to kiss the protein. And then with this kiss of death, uh, the, the aux IAA gets ubiquitinated, by the SCF system, and this protein is degraded. With the degradation, we have transcription activation, and the transcription activation will lead to plant death. On the other hand, we have a reduction on the arm of this uh, PV1 region, and it, it cannot embrace very well, and it has a hard time to, to really hug the, the region that is supposed to hug. And then it, not kiss it, it cannot kiss it very well. So the ubiquitination will not happen. This protein will remain uh, uh, alive, let's say, not degraded. And it will perform its transcriptional repression. And the plants will survive at the end. So as a general conclusion for this work, and here I will finish, uh, I. I'd like to say that this is, those two projects uh, are a very um, nice accomplishments for the Weed Lab uh, team because CSU and the Weed Lab team have been, are being pioneers 
on deciphering the mechanisms of auxin resistance. The first, uh, the first case that was uh, characterized was this Dibron amino acid substitution in kosher. That uh, was amino acid substitution G to N in the IAA 16 of kosher. And this project was an association between Dr. Phil Astra here in the weed lab and uh, the people from Monsanto, the old Monsanto, and they were able to find the first, uh, to, to characterize the first case of this. And now the weed lab was able to find two new cases uh, and to decipherate them. Uh, first is the 27 base per deletion in mustard, and the second one was 2,4-D hydroxylation, just to show how uh, this innovative research at CSU has been important for the wheat science and, and science in general community of wheat science. And uh, for future works, what I am doing right now in this uh, last month that I, I am at CSU is measuring ubiquitination at the IAA2 proteins in, a, I must say, very elegant experiments that I am hoping that they will work. And also identify the, that one will be for the next students, was is to identify and validate the P450 genes that will be involved in 2 d resistant in water hemp. And um, also, I think Dr. Preston is doing it in mustard, is to evaluate fitness costs of uh, I, the IA2 resistant and in mustard. And uh, also, probably here at CSU, we are going to see how those uh, resistant plants adapt to uh, agronomic systems. So at this, at the end, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Curtiva and CNPQ that founded most of this research. And CNPQ got uh, a my scholarship for the first four years. CSU, I'd like also to acknowledge uh, God because uh, I feel that I don't deserve all of this. And I, uh, he gave me this opportunity to uh, live such an exciting life with opportunities that not many people have. My family that invested all my education, my brothers and my sister that are always at my side in my decisions. Uh, my wife, which is the best lab assistant and the best uh, partner that is, was in my, side, in my side, even at the really hard and difficult moments during this research and this time at CSU, and my little daughter, Cece. Also for the committee members, for Todd, for choosing me in a time that I, I was, I didn't have anything. My English was bad, I, I didn't have any experience on molecular biology, but he trusted in me and in my capacities, even when I was not trusting much. So, and I would like also to acknowledge Dr. Chris Arguezo to all the interesting conversations that we have done for the for pushing me towards excellence and correcting me for Dr. Reddy that opened his lab for me and I could do most of the molecular part of my work uh, in, in his lab for Dr. Frank Dayan uh, helping me on, on the herbicide uh, structure or metabolism structure characterization and also for those amazing scientists at CSU Australia UK France. India that's just helped me and I couldn't be able to do anything uh, without their help. Also the weed lab team, especially the RLs that spent so many hours doing all those experiments. Thank you very much all for your presence. Marcelo, great job. Well, everyone, um, please feel free to use the uh, chat box to type in your questions for Marcelo. Let me open my <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Well, Marcelo, I might uh, give you a question while we're waiting for uh, some more to type in. You okay. know, the the conventional wisdom has been that there there's a lot of redundancy in these oxyase. There, you know, how many genes? Twenty four in Arabidopsis, and how is it that uh, this mutation in this one uh, confers two four D resistance? What does that tell us possibly about redundancy in oxyase? So uh, those oxyase, um, like they can compensate each other. And interesting, uh, so like when you, in the presence of auxin, degrade some of them, um, there are mechanisms, even at the auxin translation, uh, translation machinery to compensate uh, the degradation of those. And I think IHU is one, an important one in this case, because if you see the levels of expression of IA2, they are pretty low in untreated plants. And when you spray uh, the plants with 2,4-D, it can increase like five to six fold, something like that, the expression. So my guess is that IA2 is like a protective uh, IAA, and th this mutation uh, helps uh, the plants to endure herbicide, but also to not suffer too much with the mutation because it, the presence of the other IAAs that can be easily degraded um, uh, can make this IAHU remain down-regulated so the plants will not suffer too much with the fitness costs of this mutation. That's what I... Um, I don't know if I answer it, but yeah, it's great. Thanks. We've yeah. got a few questions coming in the chat box now. So if you back uh, uh, one from Doug or kind of a two part question and a couple others in there as well. Let me see. Or Doug Simon. Uh, for metabolism and relative loss of toxicity, is that do we stake or how would you show? It's not. Uh, so, yeah, that's that was a problem that we found, like how to make those metabolites, those uh, synthesized metabolites that we um, that we synthesize to get into the plants. Because I know that some hydroxylated herbicides still have uh, the same um, action as the parent compound. But uh, sometimes they just can be, they just don't have ways to enter inside of the cell. Um, so what I did was, and, and I, I didn't repeat this experience, that's why I didn't present them. What I did was I took the plants out of the petri dishes and I washed them in water and extracted, I extracted a little bit of, uh, I extracted the metabolites and I injected the LCMS. And actually, 5-hydroxy 2,4-D was able to enter uh, inside of the cell. So likely uh, this loss of toxicity is uh, true. Um, I think I got that one. Um, would you use your PCI to examine? So, <clears throat> to examine, so Richard Napier, could you use your PCR assay to examine populations fitness and patterns of spread in the field. Actually, uh, the part of uh, of field characterization uh, in these resistant populations was already done by Dr. Preston, and that will be in the article that we are going to publish. Um, Dr. Preston has like a some kind of liber library of plants that he collected in the field, and he ran those. Uh, those primers in those uh, populations. And they, most of them have uh, the deletion. I think just one of the resistant populations didn't show the deletion, so that would be uh, another uh, mechanism. But, uh, and Dr. Preston is also doing a fitness cost, um, a fitness cost experiment, uh, both in greenhouse and in field. I did one experiment in in greenhouse conditions, and I didn't see 
differences between the plants homozygous for resistant or susceptible allele in terms of plant growth and seed production. Um, so Eric Patterson, when you were working your Rhabdopsis transgenic lines, was it onto wild type Rhabdopsis or was it onto into an IAA2 knockout? Uh, that is to say, was that is to say, was it substitution of a uh, ARA IAA for the mustard IAA? So uh, I got the tDNA insertion line of um, the Arabopsis IAA two, and uh, but that was after I started the process of transforming plants. So the plants were transformed into Columbia zero. Uh, but I sprayed tDNA insertion lines with uh, knockouts on the IA2, and they were there was no difference on the compared to Columbia Zero. Both, both plants were pretty susceptible uh, in the presence after you spray the herbicide. Uh, Doc Simons. In the binding assay, it seems that the dicamba has less affinity to release. So what is the phenotype when you spray with dicamba? Is the resistance also present? So um, in that, it's interesting because dicamba doesn't have very uh, as high effect as 2,4-D in brassica, or at least in Arabopsis. So um, like Arabopsis is quite more resi uh, tolerant to dicamba compared to 2,4-D. But yeah, when you spray plants, both in post, like as root assays or in, in post emergence, it showed resistance to dicamba and several other herbicides. I have the list here, but uh, for Rinscore, it showed resistance for um, furoxipir um, and another three different herbicides. I have the list here, I can, I can read it. Afterwards, but yeah, this this deletion really is a problem because it's not just a, a single, not just two for the NMCPA, but several uh, oxy molecules that is related. Uh, is there any questions? Did you get any other? Time? No, I think you covered all the questions in there. Yeah. Let me just check the herbicide. The, Oh, yeah, so a follow-up question uh, from Chinchi asking about fluoroxypir resistance. Yeah, so here's the list. 2,4-D, MCPA, dicamba, tricopyr, picloram, and fluoroxypir. It's resistant to all those. Yeah, so yeah, it has through experience resistance. So why picloron or two for D instead of all? The oxygen herbicides. Uh, why did I use those two? Is that, is that the question, dog? And also, Marcelo, we have the question above it from Dana McGregor. So that's um, uh, talking about the IA2. Um, Gus construct with cell type specific expression. Um, we probably better um, just for the uh, after this, we'll move on to Marcelo's uh, defense exam with this committee. So Marcelo, if you can get through the, the questions that are here and then we'll stop and so you can have a break before the exam starts. OK, so. I, I'm not finding the Gus one. Where is it? Or right, I, I will answer those. Yeah, the ones from those. So why discriminate and pick on 2,4-D? I use 2,4-D just because <clears throat> MCPA and 2,4-D were the first 
herbicides that those populations were sprayed with. And I needed to limit it at least to two herbicides to do my assays. And that's why I just picked two for the, and I can, it's not because I'm discriminating <laughs> other herbicides. It's just because it was, well, was where this story began, you know. Does IA2 interact with other proteins than tier one? Yes, IA2 interacts with AFB5. So tier one and AFB5 are the most important uh, uh, receptors like the SCF F-box protein receptors for, um, <clears throat> for auxinic herbicides. Uh, so there is a cell file file specific expression pattern of IA2 because okay so for IA2 I couldn't I couldn't clone it using uh, using the GUS promoter so I would need to amplify the IA2 from our uh, Cisimbra Oriental promoter tagged with GUS didn't have to do didn't time I didn't have time to do that but what I did was I extracted um tissue from a spray plants. And what I am going to do right now is to measure uh, the expression of certain uh, responsive genes to auxin. And one of them is the GH3.3, which is the gene that the, um, that the promoter was extracted to do the, the DR5 gus arabdopsis. So we'll be able to analyze how um, how like auxin is being uh, acting as an expression agent on those IA2 deleted and susceptible versions. <clears throat> Great. Well, let's uh, say thanks again one more time to Marcelo. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining today. It's so, so awesome, uh, so great, especially to have Marcelo's family and friends in Brazil on the call. And uh, we'll just, uh, Marcelo will take um, a break into the committee, um, Frank, Reddy, and Chris. Um, do you want to reconvene, uh, let's say at 1020, if we take about a 10 minute break? Oh, sorry, um, I think 1020? Sounds 10 good. We've got the link for uh, the, the other meeting room for that, so. Thanks. Bye bye. Sorry. Good luck. Parabéns, Brice. Congrats. Congrats. Congrats, Marcelo. Thank you. Parabéns.